This bulletin proudly brought to you in association with Alex Campbell's menswear. Kia ora, good evening. Welcome to the South Today. I'm Daryl Bazer. New Zealand is nearly three quarters of the way through the COVID-19 lockdown, with the government set to review the Level 4 status on April 20th. There are 20 new cases, made up of six confirmed cases and 14 suspected ones, bringing the total number of COVID-19 cases in New Zealand to 1,386. One person remains in the Eden Hospital in a critical condition. Things are changing for New Zealand as this global pandemic continues to spread and the South today isn't immune to the issues facing the nation as we all band together to stop the spread of COVID-19. We at Allied Press thank you for your viewership and understanding at this time as New Zealand joins the rest of the world in doing everything possible to reduce the impacts of the virus. We open tonight looking at the financial impact on the region of the lockdown, which has closed non-essential businesses. Otago Daily Times Head of Video News Tim Miller caught up with Otago Chamber of Commerce Chief Executive Dougal, Dougal McGowan via video link today. With the government expected to announce what life will look like after the Level 4 lockdown, we speak with Otago Chamber of Commerce Chief Executive Dougal McGowan about how Otago businesses are coping and what they need to see in the coming weeks. So uh, what's the ger general feeling amongst the Otago business community at the moment, three weeks in? Yeah, so we're, we've got a variety of different responses, depends where you are within the community. Uh, so yeah, North Otago and, and Balclutha, uh, yeah, they've got pretty strong uh, primary sector um, economies um, as, well as, as, well as, as well as other areas. But what they're seeing is a, a bit more stability as opposed to the Queenstowns and the Wanakas, which have been dramatically affected. Equally within there, you know, you've got sectors such as hospitality, uh, tourism, each one of them has their own niche issues um, that, that need to be worked through. So, you know, a lot of things happening out there at the moment and a lot of businesses feeling a lot of pain. Uh, and also the people who are working in them, um, you know, starting to struggle a little bit. And what are businesses looking for from the government, you know, in the coming days when they announce what's going to happen after the Level 4 lockdown? Have you heard much about that, what they want or need? Yeah, so the, the, the key part is um, trying to get some more certainty around what that level three is going to look like for business. Because um, once they start to get some of the, 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 the foundations and the frameworks in which they can understand how they can start opening their businesses again, or if they can open their business, then they can start getting some of that planning done. And we know that many of them are working on that now with a whole lot of different scenarios about, you know, how close you can be to other people. Um, <clears throat> what you can trade in, what areas you can, can't. Um, and, and it's about then how they're going to be able to adapt as quickly as they possibly can to, to then re-attract their customers back into the business. And what can um, people, you know, the consumers or customers, what, what can they do at the moment uh, to kind of help some businesses that are still going? What, what, what can they do? Yeah, look, I mean, it's, it's a really interesting space. Because, you know, for, for most of us now, we've been behind closed doors or in, inside for, for, for almost a month. You know, I think uh, my credit card, uh, my bank and my credit card think I've actually passed away. I'm sure I'll get a letter soon because, you know, we've had three transactions and that's three times to the supermarket. Um, so, you know, it's going to be really important that we that we allow people time to, to rechange their behaviours again and get back out into our communities and, and start to, to, you know, spend some money. But we also know that some people have lost their jobs or some people are on decreased wages for a period of time. So that, that um, could be a longer, a longer haul for, for many businesses. And do you think we might see some businesses just not be able to cope um, with, with a, the extended lockdown, whatever that's for, or level three or whatever? Yeah, absolutely. There's, I mean, the, the long-term effects of this are going to continue on for quite a while. And the government is doing a good job making uh, changes to a variety of different um, conditions, and they've done some more today. But, you know, we, we know, for example, that there's some businesses have been closed for a month. Uh, the next stage is that they may be able to go back to work for part of next month, but they won't be able to bill maybe till the end of the month or the, or, or the start of the next month, which means they don't get paid till halfway through at the end of that month. So there's really a three-month cash, cash flow issue for some of them. Uh, coming up and they've got to be really closely tied in with their accountants and their banks to be able to manage that over the next wee while but 
you know, things like the wage subsidy were a huge boost to many businesses that keep the doors open. Without that, they, many would be closed. And closer to home, is there anything that local government councils can be doing to help businesses at this time? Yeah, so um, yeah, we've been in, we've been in contact with all of the councils, so all of the CEOs and and uh, mayors and C uh, and, and, and in the case of the Otago Regional Council, the the chair, uh, we're working th with them on a number of their issues that they're having, you know, um, around what how they're going to look at rates and all those sorts of things, and we we do firmly believe that uh, that um, local and regional councils all have a role to play uh, when we get into that uh, recovery phase. Um, what the key part there is making sure that we've got um, a priority of projects uh, that allow for economic platforms or economic growth or jobs to be produced uh, without creating more disruption to business. So that, that's the sort of line we're working with with them. And obviously some um, sectors have been impacted more and will be continued like tourism and hospitality is, you know, is a, a, you know, a time for them where they really need to start thinking about what they can do differently once the things you know, settle down a little bit. Yeah, well, it's going to be going back to making sure that they continue to, to try to look after those loyal customers they have, because we know that the people from overseas aren't coming, which is that top up. So, you know, how do we create an environment where locals and regulars are encouraged to come back and feel safe to come back? Uh, and that's going to be about that reconnection with people. Um, whether we've got that physical distancing, we don't want to maintain a, a massive drift away from our friends. So we want to make sure that we're socially still connected and there's an opportunity for hospitality to be able to play a role in that, um, to be able to make sure that people are still connected in those spaces. So um, there, there's a bit of adaption that will have to be made around seating and requirements and, and cleanliness and cleaning and all those sorts of things. But those businesses were doing it in those in that week before uh, the close down. So you know, they've just got to you know encourage people to, to feel safe to come out uh, and socialise again when the time is right. And more generally, do you think this is giving this you know four week period is giving businesses um, a chance to look at how they can just do different things differently in the long term. You know, working from home, that sort of thing, saving money here and there. Is that, that something that they can take advantage of? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think there's many businesses now looking at how and what they do, uh, how they look after their people, but most importantly about how they're connecting with their customers and and, and what their future client base is going to look like. Um, I think there's many businesses will look at, at how they can do things differently. Uh, and we've seen some great adaptions from some big companies within Dunedin, uh, which are now supplying things within a week's, well, a week's time. They turn totally to online and are delivering to people's homes. Um, so we're seeing that, that adaption happening really quickly. And, and some will now start to get their head above the parapet so they can start to look at it. Now they've got a bit of stability around staffing and wages and those sorts of things, understanding that, and they'll be starting to look at those things right now about, right, how am I going to be able to adapt and pivot to change to that new new paradigm that we're now in? And looking forward, you know, a month ahead, what, what do businesses need or want from, you know, from the government or from whoever else over the next month to kind of make sure that they're, they're surviving? Yeah, so, so immediately this week, the key priority now is understanding that level three. Um, and then from there on, once we start to understand what the new trends are going to be with people going out and spending and, and spending patterns, we won't know that for a period of time, but we know that the government currently is looking at adaptive measures the whole time. Each week we're seeing those adaptions happen and they're, they're vital for businesses. You know, if we, uh, we might come out to level three or level two, but we may not get people going back into shops or businesses. They may continue just to, to stick around that, that um, you know, the, the supermarket shopping because we saw, you know, they had a 17% rise in May. Um, you know, if we don't see those changes, then those businesses are going to need additional support um, in those sectors um, to be able to keep the doors open. You know, for some, it might be that they go into a hibernation period for some businesses where they, they lock the doors for a period of time. And that's where the wage subsidies will be just as important to keep good staff on um, so that when they can open the doors that they'll, they'll be able to trade uh, positively. Cool. And you personally, how are you coping with uh, lockdown life? <laughs> yeah. uh, look, um, let's, uh, to be quite honest, the, the Chamber has been incredibly busy. You know, we've, we've hosted over over 200 one-on-ones already or getting close to 200 one-on-ones already. We've had, uh, within a week and a half, we had over 615 people in on free webinars to help them deal with stuff. 
Uh, we've filled our quota of business mentors and we need still more of those if there are people out there that can help business mentors. It's an incredibly busy time for us, but you know, as a chamber ourselves, we, we face challenging times. Uh, we've got to ourselves and our board and myself and the senior leadership team, we're looking at what does the future of the chamber look like? You know, traditionally we've been a, a membership events and training organisation uh, under the current um, level four lockdown that, that doesn't go so well because you can't get people in. Um, there's not the money there for people to, to do some of those things. So yeah, we're having that ourselves. But me personally, yeah, we're in our bubble uh, with my family. Um, and uh, you know, the dog thinks it's great uh, because he's getting walked every day and the ball's being thrown to him. So he thinks it's the best thing since sliced bread. But the rest of us are, are having a little time out every now and again in our own little bubbles inside our big bubble. Great. Well, uh, thanks for joining us today, Dougal. Much appreciated. No worries. Really appreciate your time. Otago University Rhodes Scholar and Otago Daily Times columnist Jean Belshin has been based at Oxford University in the UK for the past couple of years. She's taking a break from studies and is safely hunkered down as the United Kingdom is mostly closed to try and stop the spread of COVID-19. How are things with the uh, global pandemic where you are? Um, obviously, the UK isn't doing that well. Um, I think our death toll surpassed 12,000 today um, and it's estimated that actual coronavirus-related deaths could be 15% higher. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's pretty troubling and I am counting myself fortunate to have a job that is secure and one in which I can work from home and I'm very fortunate also to have a really strong community of friends and um, yeah, just lovely and kind people around me here in Oxford in case I need anything. Brilliant. And yeah, so quite famously, um, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has um, recovered from COVID. Um, how do you, th he's one of the very lucky few. Uh, how do you think the UK government as a whole is actually handing, handling the situation? Well, I must admit, I'm not a public health expert, nor am I a scientist or a doctor. Um, but I think anyone can see that the reaction the UK took was incredibly delayed and problematic from the very start. I mean, back in January, we were alerted um, by China of, of what this virus was and could do. And yet, you know, the, the MPs in the UK took over eight weeks to recognise the seriousness of COVID-19. We ignored the warnings coming out of China and just watched and waited. And I think maybe politicians were wary about stoking, you know, public panic, which did did erupt, you know, over here. It certainly would stop piling and, and all that. But it seems to me to be a case of too little, too late in terms of the action the government took. I mean, also the whole concept of herd immunity here seems like a very poor decision to make off the bat when you're dealing with, um, you know, a virus that is completely novel. We haven't dealt with this particular strain before. Um, herd immunity is a phenomenon that is employed when you're talking about actual vaccinations and, <laughs> and diseases that we have our heads wrapped around. But um, yeah, this was an entirely different scenario. So I'm thankful that they seem to be taking it seriously now. I mean, they've been forced to, given the disaster it, it is now. Um, but I wish that the government had heeded the advice from China far earlier. And you're still based around Oxford. Uh, how has uh, that historic campus um, changed over the last, say, four to six weeks? Oh, it's a completely different city. It's utterly bizarre. Previously, you couldn't leave your house without being mobbed by crowds of tourists and, and students. Um, I mean, it was such a busy, thriving city. And I, and I guess it still is, but it's all indoors. And when we go out for our state-sanctioned state walk, you know, um, the city's just utterly deserted. And it's a shame. It's summertime here. The sky is a bright blue the gorgeous stone buildings are lit with golden sunshine, but there's no one out and about enjoying it. And the city is just like a ghost town, essentially. And you're taking a, you've, you were a Rhodes Scholar and you're taking a break from studies. Um, what's, what are you doing at present? 
So yeah, currently I am working as an events and communications officer for TORCH, which stands for the Oxford Research Centre for the Humanities. So it's like a special branch within um, the Humanities Division of Oxford University. And uh, I'm really enjoying it. Obviously, all our public events have had to be moved online. So we've gone from holding, you know, regularly, almost daily events to um, live streaming things and collating digital content, but taking it in our stride and it's going well. And uh, with you saying uh, online events, um, in NZ we're all quarantined in our own little bubbles. Uh, what strategies like that has the UK government got in place? Uh, very similar to the best of my knowledge. Um, we are also uh, in quarantine in bubbles essentially, although they're not using that terminology. I do like it. Um, we are, yeah, we're, we're meant to be staying inside except for one walk or run a day. Um, and we also, we shouldn't be leaving the house apart from that, that walk or to go to the doctor or the pharmacy or the supermarket. Um, and of course, they're encouraging us to wash our hands as frequently as we can and stay at least two, two metres away from other people. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I don't know, like I said before, a case of too little too late. I think um, the NHS is completely swamped at the moment. There's a complete lack of, well, there's a yeah, severe shortage of PPE. Um, doctors and nurses in the front lines are really struggling and it's horrendous. It was quite, I watched um, uh, the Prime Minister Johnson's um, piece uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, saying about the NHS and how UK was having to rally together to protect the NHS. And it seems, yeah, he seems incredibly fortunate to have survived. Yeah, I mean, considering how chronically underfunded the NHS is and the fact that, you know, only a few years ago, Boris Johnson and his cronies voted against giving nurses and doctors a pay rise. And yet they're the very people who saved his life. Um, yeah. <laughs> I hope he's come out of this ordeal with a newfound appreciation for the NHS and I hope that his actions will speak louder than his words from now on. How, and so personally you're, you know, uh, Kiwi, um, spent a lot of time down in Otago but family around in New Zealand. Um, how is it, be, what's it like for you being 13,000 miles away? Um, to be honest, I've probably been Skyping my family more now during this pandemic than I did previously because a few of my siblings have returned home and they brought with them a knowledge of how technology works and therefore how to Skype me. So um, I've really been loving FaceTiming and Skyping the family. Um, and like I mentioned, I have friends over here that obviously I can't meet in person, but I can FaceTime and I know that, you know, should something happen, I can have groceries delivered and the like. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, I'm taking my health quite seriously because I am an immunocompromised person. So I really don't want to get this perfect virus. Um, but that being said, I'm grateful that we are still allowed to leave our house for a walk each day. I'm so grateful that it's coming on summertime here. So there's sunshine and long days. I couldn't imagine being stuck at home in the winter time. So yeah, my heart goes out to you all. <laughs> Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time at um, around you know, three in the morning, your time. It's uh, nice to catch up. You're more than welcome, Daryl. Thank you for calling. Now time for a look at the weather. Tonight's weather proudly brought to you by Mole Map. Beginning with the situation, the cold southwesterly airflow is set to ease tomorrow, but the next low pressure system will be incoming on Friday with rain developing and more unsettled weather on the way for the weekend. In the southern towns, the Catalans and Belclutha are due for decreasing southwesterlies and clearing skies with 13 degrees. Lumsden and Gore can expect decreasing southwesterlies, skies clearing and one degree lower on 12. Heading over to the central lakes, Wanaka and Alexandra are both heading for moderate westerlies, high cloud and 14 degrees. Queenstown is the same but cooler on 13, while Tiano can expect freshening westerlies with rain later and 13 degrees. In the northern towns, Timaru and Wamaru are due for variable winds, cloudy skies and 15 degrees, while inland Twizel and Omarama are both in line for moderate westerlies, some high cloud 
and 15 degrees. In Dunedin, it'll be cloudy tonight with westerly winds and an overnight low of 8 degrees. Expect a few sunny periods early tomorrow, but then it becomes cloudy during the morning, a high of 13 and a low of 9. Expect rain on Friday with cold temperatures and gusty northeasterlies, a high of 12 and a low of 10 and a low of 10 degrees. And heading down to Invercargill, you're in line for showers tonight with gusty southwesterlies and a low of 7 degrees. Showers clear tomorrow with a few sunny periods developing. It'll be cold with strong gusty southwesterlies decreasing. A high of 12 and a low of 9. You should also avoid hanging the washing out on Friday as you're also in for periods of rain with strong north northwesterly winds developing. A high of 13 and a low of 10. And that's all from the South Today team for this Wednesday. For the latest news from the southern region, head online to odt.co.nz and follow Channel 39 on Facebook and YouTube. Stay, tu stay tuned to Channel 39 for the latest COVID-19 updates from the government. Stay calm during the pandemic, and as the Prime Minister says, be kind. Ta kite e popo. See you tomorrow. This bulletin proudly brought to you in association with Alex Campbell's menswear. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.